Welcome to SC24, the supercomputing conference. We're here at the Dell Technologies Compound. I am Dave Nicholson with 65 on the road, and we're going to be talking about some pretty cool AI stuff. I have two incredible gentlemen with me, Delmar Hernandez Hi. from Dell Technologies and Steen Graham. And Steen, who are you from? Metro AI. We're going to talk all about Metro AI and what they do, but I want to start with a discussion of a pretty incredible platform that's just hitting the streets, the PowerEdge XE9680. Did I get that right? That's right. So tell us about this platform, and then we can get into the cool things that, that you guys have been doing with it. But tell us about this platform. Yeah, so the, the PowerEdge XE9680 is our flagship AI server. Uh, in this case, we're talking about the AMD Instinct accelerators. This guy has eight accelerators in it. Um, we've We've worked with Metrum over the last few months, actually, to develop quite a few assets on top of this platform, right? So we supply the hardware. These guys supply the AI solutions that run on top of the hardware. So specifically, these are MI300s? Yes. Is that right? And yes. there are eight? Eight the, of them. Eight in the chassis? Yes. So is it fair to say that this PowerEdge server consumes more power than a 100-watt light bulb? Yeah, a little bit more. A do little they, bit more. Do they do they have to be water cooled, or do, is that very dependent upon? Oh, that's a great they, question. So that, the XC ninety six eighty is still air cooled. This it is. is an air cooled server. Yes. Okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah. It's a six U server, so it's a little tall. Okay. Um, but it's still air cooled for sure. Okay. So what are some of the cool things that Metrum and Dell are doing with this? Let's get you know it's I I I'm I'm a long time hardware guy, so I could sit and, and, and Delmar and I could talk about this for the rest of the the segment about how cool this is. But let's talk about that next next level up. What's what's been going on in the world of AI while these platforms have been developed? Yeah, I think one one of the things that's really happened with AI was where, you know, a couple of years ago we were talking about transformer models and the advent of large language models, and we were running these single use large language models in these chatbot applications. And you know, last year we talked about retrieval augmented generation because we knew that we wanted to supplement those models with accurate retrieved information to put them in a position to not hallucinate and give us accurate information. Uh, but over the last nine months, what we've seen is the rise of AI agents. And that really, you know, perfectly pairs with the platform that the team at Dell has developed. Because the XE9680, especially with the MI300X accelerators, it gives us the memory footprint to deploy a breadth of software on this because it's no longer just the LLM model, it's the embeddings model, it's the vector DB or the Grag DB, it's the agentic framework on top of that. And as Delmar alluded to, it's all of the software that we need for vertical industry solutions. And so, you know, live down here in the booth, we're showing a telecommunications use case. We've got AI agents monitoring telecommunication infrastructure. That requires, you know, telco-based OSS feeds, Kafka-based data off the telemetry. Uh, we have to give these agents the opportunity to call APIs to get network statistics like drop call rates. And so as, as we move to this more systematic compound software stack, it really plays to the strength of the XC9680 packed with MI300X accelerators, which give us the, the breadth of capacity we need and the performance to run these real world AI applications. So, so Delmar, I think it's kind of funny that he said last year. Dude, it was last quarter. <laughs> yeah. There yeah. is no last year anymore. Yeah. Too yeah. much changes month after month. He mentioned memory available in a fully loaded out 9680. What, what are we looking at in terms yeah. of so, system memory? So each GPU has 192 gigs, okay. right? So you add that up, that's one and a half terabytes of memory. Of course. GPU memory, right? <laughs> so like one of the, the approaches that we took here is like, how do we showcase the advantage of having that much memory, right? So okay. working with Metrum, we've deployed large language models, like 70 billion parameter models on single GPUs. I can't remember if we talked about this last time, but I think it was very early. We had we had not RTS this product, so that we were a little light on details, but now we can say that we've We've deployed Llama, Llama 3.170B on a single GPU. Okay. We can deploy eight instances of that model on a single server, and then we can train that model on that same server, right? And that's that's enabled by the, the GPU capacity. The what, what's what's the footprint of a model? When you say you deployed Llama on a single GPU, I, I'm an old storage guy. I mean, literally, is this is this like, oh, it's a 100 gig file? Is it a file when you deploy the model? 
Yeah, and I think... I um, mean, it's data on the server. Yeah, you, it's you data on the server. You have no external think, connectivity yeah, at that point. Yeah, and I think what, you know, yeah, exactly. And I think what Delmar is alluding to is like, you know, what's what we can do with the MI300X accelerators is we can fully load a FP or a BF16 precision model Okay. in that capacity. You need a little buffer capacity on top of that memory footprint. Okay. But that, that full memory footprint is fully loaded at that point with some buffer capacity to functionally run the model. The cool thing is we couldn't do that with the other, um, you know, leading GPU on the markets because they didn't have the memory footprint to run that. And that, that drives the whole TCO story. And you can really accelerate that TCO story when you look at the, you know, like the Llama recent 400, you know, 5 billion parameter model. You can run that fully loaded. That model takes up all of the memory footprint Delmar just mentioned on an XC9680 with a little buffer enough to run it at that FP16, you know, BF16 precision footprint. And that's why if, if you hear like uh, Meta talk about how they're running MI300X with Llama 400 you know, plus B, it's because of that memory footprint allows us to do that on one XC9680 okay. instead of using two, which is a big difference. Now there are different um, you know, precisions like FP8, so we, could, we can right. take the memory footprint down in FP8. But if you look at some of the solutions we're deploying um, downstairs, it's like we're running on our, on our medical solution, we're running you know, 70 billion on four of the GPUs, but we're also running a vision language model uh, for pathology, which we take skin biopsies and determine if they're cancerous or not. We're taking two GPUs to do that. We're running the embeddings model on another GPU. We're running the voice model on another GPU. And so you can see how you can easily stretch out that memory footprint to accommodate all this new, you know, I'd say agentic rag software that needs to be required to do that. And that's where the TCO story comes in great for the the XC9680 with the MI300X accelerators. So talk a little bit more about Metrum in particular. What 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 is what is Metrum all about? Yeah. We 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 hear we hear a lot about the collaboration between Dell Technologies and Metrum. Yeah. And um, and you're often talking about some of the forward-looking, really cool actual use cases for things yeah. built on top of the hardware. What what's Metrum's story? Yeah, Metrum's all about high fidelity real world AI and you know, deployed in enterprises and helping enterprises, you know, transform their business, whether it's an AI agent that, you know, operates semi-autonomously to, you know, support their customers with, you know, lower wait times and upsell their customers when they need a higher, you know, internet connection bandwidth, you know, or it's a medical solution where, you know, we want to, you know, enable doctors not to, you know, spend 20% of their time typing, which is the CEO of the Cleveland Clinic two weeks ago said, you know, the, the best indicator to a doctor's productivity is their typing speed because they got so much administrative tasks. Right. And so enabling them with, you know, voice capability, with the language model to write up the perfect report that they need to write and the right template, you know, for, for their clinic or hospital, you know, incredibly important. And so we're all about that. To do that though, one of the other things you need to do to deliver high fidelity enterprise AI is you need to continuously test all the latest models. And not only on the metrics like throughput and latency and whether they can be observed in a memory footprint on one system or two, because that's a, that's a seven figure impact, Yeah. right? Um, you need to also be able to test the quality of the models based on those domain specific metrics in development and in production. So we also have the capability to continuously know your AI, whether it's in development or in production as well. And so we care really about measuring the AI, you know, so you can know your AI and ultimately grow your business. So Delmar, we get we have we have terms and three letter acronyms, four letter acronyms coming at us fast and furiously in the world of AI now. Um, one thing that is talked about right now is uh, the concept of an agent or agentic AI, right. um, autonomous agents, uh, autonomousity, I just made that up. Uh, but if I were to ask you, what, what, what constitutes an agent in AI? What, what, what do you think? And then Steen, I, I want you to yeah. jump in after we hear. So I, I think this is where I like, so I've, I've spent a lot of time digging through logs, platform logs, application right. logs, operating system logs. I'm sure a lot of our IT people out there have been in the same in the same boat where you're trying to correlate one log to the other log. Did you find like, any agents in there? Yeah, no, I was the agent, right? <laughs> so you've got like a, a, a massive set of logs and you're trying to figure out what broke. Um, so, so what we're doing with these AI agents is we're taking that work out, like we're, we're, we're solving that problem, right? The, the, the chatbot is actually going in and making these correlations across logs automatically. So like we, 
Maybe the, we'll, I'll let Steen dig, dig into the details of the application, but we're real-time streaming application logs from machines that are running in a, in a telco base station. But how, how does it know what to do? Are you train? Are you are you at at some point in the at the beginning? Are you telling it this is what I want you to do? Yeah. So yeah. you say it does it automatically or automatically, but it's under your control. Yes, that, yeah. so that's where the okay. Metro magic comes in, right? Okay, okay. They're, they're figuring out how to make those correlations okay, on top okay. of the power edge server. Okay, yeah. so, so yeah, so and I think, Metro magic. Let's yeah, Metro so magic. I mean, yeah, it's a great example when we talk about like IT logs and, you know, we, we built a solution where we're, we're monitoring IT logs and, you know, Del Mar does this all the time. You know, when he, when he gets an Ethernet port and he gets an error, he knows exactly what he wants to do in that particular case. If you're managing a bigger infrastructure, you've got to do things like do a root cause analysis of what the problem has occurred. And we, we can tell the agent, hey, here's what you're gonna do. Look for log failures, not with the human eye, but with your agentic you know, view of the world. And then when you see a log failure, go back into our embeddings model in the vector database and the repository of history and look at like, you know, what that could be and make a recommendation to the human you know, on, on what that could be. You could, you, if you think the AI's agent, your digital worker is good enough, you could let them make a recommendation all the way to a, issuing a work order to repair that system. Hey, let's you know pop in a new Ethernet port in this particular circumstance. And so you know the agents you know allow us, or the you know, way we program agents is we program them the way we would humans do the work. And sometimes that's like you know the the dull you know, and even sometimes dangerous you know, or dirty jobs as well. And so, but particularly for those dull jobs that we can give the agent that job to do and then the human can be looped in at a later time. You know, it's incredibly important for our medical solution that we're showing. We have a lot more human in the loops on that medical solution, but you know, there is some autonomy on that solution to, to make determinations. So I have a good example. So, yeah, yeah. so last night, the servers that were running the demos on live downstairs rebooted like okay. 2 a.m. We came in this morning and they had rebooted. We're like, okay, what happened? So we went back and like, I'm emailing our, the IT guy in our lab, like, hey, like, did you reboot him? Like, we have no idea what happened, right? So there's, I emailed him, he goes and manually checks the logs. We're looking at like the power in the building, all sorts of things to figure out what went wrong. Imagine if like with these, these sorts of solutions, I could just chat with, with the solution and say, what happened what at happened 2 a.m.? And then it goes and checks PDU logs, iDRAC logs on the PowerEdge server, application logs running on that server automatically and it comes back with a response that says this none happened. Yeah. It yeah. says none yet. And yeah. you say none yet, <laughs> none yet business. Yeah. So and this can happen in seconds, right? Right now this was a 30 minute conversation this morning that we had trying to figure out what happened. This this sort of response is like within five to ten sec but within five to ten seconds we get all of these insights. Like right and that's that's huge. Do you, do you see do you see having a group of agents and you know keep it simple. Let's say you have five of these agents that can perform different tasks, does that put you in more of a managerial function where you're orchestrating these agents and having them do things? Does that just make you more sort of horizontally productive from an IT perspective? Or does it allow you also, maybe it's an and or, I don't know, um, does it allow you to, to, to focus on higher level tasks? Because that's it's, always been the pitch. Yeah. When we talk about increasing productivity, it's not about you're gonna to get to fire 20% of your workforce. It's no, 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 you're gonna make each individual more productive so that they can focus on things that are less tedious, more intellectually stimulating, more likely to contribute greater value to the business. What do you think? It's kind of a philosophical so, question. Your experience so yeah. far with these agents. Yeah, what so do you think? what I like about it is like I said, we spent 30 minutes trying to figure out what went, what went wrong and then we solved the problem. Imagine if we could have spent five seconds understanding what happened and then just go solve the problem. So we still have humans coming in and solving the problem. We just understand the problem and know, and then we can go tackle it, right? So it's the, it's not at a point where it can go solve all of the problems. Like, of course, there are going to be situations where we could maybe have the agent go issue a, a command at the server and do, take some action. But there's still a human that needs to come in and be like, okay, this is the appropriate action. Let's go do this. But they can reach that conclusion faster. I love it. You know, Dave, it. what that does is like that allows everybody a lot more time for, you know, those like IT administrators or professionals to go build the next supercomputers filled with the next set of digital agents. It never ends. There's so much work to be done. And I think it's totally underestimated when you put these really talented people out of the mundane jobs. You know, now maybe we can get some more liquid cooling systems out. Yeah, exactly. We can deploy some more servers and build some more agents. And I think, you know, the demographics of the globe 
you know, aren't great right now. You know, we're going to need some of these digital workers to help us because, you know, people may not want to do these, you know, these dull, <laughs> dirty and dangerous jobs going forward. Well, for uh, myself, Dave Nicholson from 6.5 on the Road, Delmar from Dell and Steen, father of the Borg, as he will be known <laughs> at some point in time. It's a great conversation to have when we're talking about actually finding ROI, positive ROI out of AI. We, you can look up and down the aisles here and you can see all sorts of examples of amazing hardware, but people are asking the question, what are the billions and trillions of dollars actually going towards? This is a great example. What the two of you have put together is a great example of that. Thanks so much for being here for the conversation. Stay tuned for more exciting action from SC24.